Okay, so we talked about polling and interrupt last time, uh, but I want to just use the next uh, couple of slides or next uh, sequence of slides uh, to show you again. Um, I particularly like these set of slides because of the animation. Um, I hope you understand better the concept of polling and the interrupt. So suppose a peripheral uh, intermittently receives data which must be serviced by the processor. So we're talking about two things. Um, we have a processor and we have a peripheral device. Uh, the, really the peripheral is just the word saying that um, there's a thing outside the, the microprocessor or microcontroller you, you need to talk to. The processor uh, can get the data uh, by using polling. That means it has to use instructions to keep checking the status of the peripheral and you know, check, are you ready or do you have data? Do you have data? Uh, if you do, then we'll go ahead and read. But if you do the polling, you're actually gonna spend a lot of CPU cycles on doing that instead of doing something um, more useful otherwise. That's why we have this concept of interrupt. Peripherals can interrupt the processor when it has data. Now for this to happen, physically there has to be a actual pin or pins. At least you need to have an interrupt pin. If you want the microcontroller or microprocessor to respond to these external events. If the interrupt pin is one um, or uh, a logic high, the processor will respond by suspending the current program and jump to a ISR interrupt service routine. So this is known as interrupt driven IO. Now underneath um, the, how this works is that essentially the polling of the interrupt pin is built into the hardware. So instead of spending instructions to read the, the status bit of the peripheral, um, the processor itself has some built-in logic which will sense the voltage level at interrupt pin. And from this hardware circuit, if it detects there is a pulse on the pin or a um, high voltage um, um, logic high on the interrupt pin, it will start the interrupt interruption process. So the processor will suspend the current program, jump to SR, et cetera. So this polling function is built into the hardware itself. As a result, the processor does not need to use instructions to check the status. There are several ways to find the ISR, especially the entry address of the SR. We call the interrupt uh, address vector. The very basic one is fixed interrupt. You find this um, more often in low end microcontrollers where there's only one interrupt. So there's really no need to differentiate what kind of interrupt. So this address is built into the processor and cannot be changed. So the ISR uh, can be stored at that address or you can put a jump instruction at that address and then jump to another address. But either way, there's only one interrupt and the um, the address sometimes like 004, 008, and that's the fixed interrupt address. The second type is a vector interrupt. A vector interrupt is that you need to provide the actual address where the uh, processor needs to find, used to find the ISR. So the exact address in the memory. This is a common when microprocessors has multiple peripherals connected by a system bus. So you want to um, tell the microprocessor that, hey, this is for interrupt service routine one, this is for the other one. You can have a compromise of these two to expand um, these um, possibilities. You can use the interrupt address table and in a table you can store the address. And for higher end microprocessors, uh, such as uh, Intel, you know, uh, Atom or 
the young processors, they all use interrupt address tables. Okay, so let's start with this picture. Um, we are seeing here the behavior or the activities on both of these two um, actors. So we're looking at the time goes uh, from, you know, vertically from uh, top to down. So this is earlier, this is future. And we have two columns, this several boxes on this column shows the behavior of the microprocessor. And this um, few boxes on the right side, these column shows the behavior, the activities of the peripheral device, which is represented using P1. And it will pre proceed from top to down uh, on the time axis. You can see there are several things happening, uh, which we'll show um, using animation in the next few slides. But essentially the microcontroller will um, execute a few things and while it's executing its main program, this peripheral may receive data and the data will be put into its register and the register has address 8,000 in hexadecimal. And because of this receiving this data, P1 will assert this interrupt signal to notify the microprocessor that you have to you know, stop whatever you're doing and to get this data out of this peripheral because it's important. So the microcontroller will say, okay, let me finish the current instruction, uh, which could be at address 100, and the microcontroller sees this interrupt signal. And so this pin is asserted. So it will save the PC, this stands for program counter, saves the current um, PC's value 100 and set the PC to the ISR, the fixed location of 16. So this fixed location uh, 16 is just, you know, for this particular microcontroller, it could be a different value. The point is, it is a fixed ISR. So the address to the first instruction of this ISR is fixed at 16. So the microprocessor will proceed to that ISR, which will read data from this address 8,000, which is the address of the peripheral, modifies the data based on the program and writes the result to a different address, 8,001. And after that, the, um, well, actually at the same time or uh, around that time, uh, because this uh, data is read, so P1 will deassert the interrupt. And finally, the ISR returns on the microprocessor side, and then it will restore the PC to the next instruction, which is about to execute before the interrupt. And then the microprocessor will resume executing. So this is the overall process. So let's look at uh, these animation to uh, understand better how they actually function. So we have a program memory and this is the main program. Um, at this point, the microprocessor is executing uh, this main program. So the program counter points to this address 100. So there's an instruction here. And we have also in the program memory, a interrupt service routine, which is located at address 16. We say this really mean that you know, the starting address of this SR is at 16. Now, of course, there are often the time we have more than one instructions. So we have 16, 17, 18, 19, and so on. Until the last instruction, uh, which is returned from SR, so RNT, RETI. And this is the microprocessor uh, we are um, trying to follow here. On the other side, 
we have a few things. We have a system bus. And the system bus has address and data, uh, address bus and data bus, plus some control signals. And on the system bus, we connect uh, data memory. We also connect some peripheral devices, which we indicate here as P1 and P2. Each of them has their own address. P1's address is 8,000, and P2's address is 8,001. And inside these peripheral devices, there are certain resources. In our case, we only have one register in each of these two peripheral devices. So when you read from 8,000, you're actually reading the value of this register. And for the case, when you write to this 8,001, you're actually putting data uh, into this peripheral two here. So the first time, uh, the, the first step, the microprocessor is executing its main program. So it's somewhere here. And P1 receives input data in the register with address 8,000 in hex decimal. So really this is what happens here. The data goes into this register. Now we're not really showing you how exactly this happens, but based on the design of the peripheral, it um, interacts with certain physical system. Uh, so, well, there will be some information coming in and we say this is the data uh, that we store in this 8,000 address, this is the new data. The second step, P1 is gonna assert this INT uh, to request servicing by the processor. So you see here, this is a physical wire that connects the micro, uh, connects the um, microprocessor with the peripheral device. When this goes to one, this indicates that P1 has data. So the microprocessor will um, complete whatever instruction is currently executing, which is 100. And it sees INT is asserted. So it has to save the value of 100 and sets the PC to the ISR, which is that fixed location of 16. So in this way, the microprocessor is going to execute the first instruction in ISR. And that's what's happened here the ISR will be executed. So we will read data from this address and we're using memory mapped IO. So you can essentially use a moving instruction uh, to read data from this 8,000 and put it in, into this internal register R0. And there could be some other instructions following uh, to modify the value of this register. And if we're satisfied, we'll then output this data uh, to this peripheral P2. So we move uh, R0 to this address here to write this new value uh, to the second peripheral. And then this interrupt service routine returns. And while at this 16, because this is a read instruction, uh, this will read data from P1 when you read, you actually assert the signal. So there'll be um, read signal asserted. So P1 itself knows how, uh, when this microprocessor read the data. So it will then deassert this INT. So this one will be deasserted. And also when we um, write this data, uh, to then the address. So this new modified data in internal register R0 will be written to this peripheral P2. This is well, what uh, we just mentioned. The uh, interrupt signal will be deasserted. And the last step uh, for the microprocessor will be to resume the main program. So it will restore PC to uh, 
100 plus one because it knows 100 was the last instruction it finished. So it will be executing the next instruction at address 101. All right, so the next few slides are very similar. Uh, it uh, you know, captures the process of the interrupt. We have the microprocessor uh, doing a few things and also the peripheral doing a few things. However, the difference between this case and the previous case is that in the previous case, we use a fixed interrupt. So 16 was the only number possible. And, you know, the peripheral doesn't need to provide such a value to the microprocessor. In this case, we are using vector interrupt. Vector interrupt, the, you can see the major difference is in step four, where P1 um, not only will you know, assert the interrupt signal, it will put a interrupt address vector on the data bus. And the 16 could be other values. And you will, the peripheral has to put such an address on the data bus to tell the microprocessor where is the ISR. Okay, so let me uh, again show this. Uh, we've seen this. We have the microprocessor here. Uh, we have peripheral devices on the other side. We have our program memory with main program and interrupt service routine. And we have the program counter. The buses are the same, although we have one more pins related to interrupt. We had interrupt signal, and also we have an interrupt acknowledgement signal. Interrupt acknowledgement signal comes from the microprocessor to the peripheral. So you see this arrow direction here. And we'll soon see how uh, interrupt, ac interrupt acknowledgement pin is uh, put into play. So again, we have the data arriving. So peripheral one will be raising the interrupt. And while microprocessor is finishing the last instruction, it sees the interrupt signal is asserted. It will save the value of the PC and it will assert interrupt acknowledgement. So this is a feedback coming from the microprocessor to the peripheral who generates the interrupt. This is to tell the peripheral that, okay, I'm ready to uh, accepting your interrupt vector. So tell me where I should go to find my interrupt service routine. And then this peripheral detects the interrupt acknowledgement. So it knows the microprocessor is waiting for it to tell him or her the, um, the um, address of the ISR. And it has this address 16 in mind. So that's the number it will put onto the system bus. The microprocessor will read this value from the system bus. This value cannot go on these two wires because there's no way you can transfer value 16 uh, using these two wires. So this is actually a value that will go through the system bus, uh, through the data bus, and goes into the microprocessor. And of course, this 16 is not a universal value here. Uh, depending on the microprocessor, you may have other different values, you know, 20, 32. Uh, so this is just an example here. And the next thing is the same as uh, in the fixed interrupt case. So ISR will be executed. We have this data uh, processing and the updated data will be put into a different peripheral. And finally, microprocessor will return to the main program. Okay, so that was the uh, very interesting animation that I think uh, will help you to understand the 
how the interrupt works. Also beyond the fixed interrupt and uh, vectored interrupt, we have a third kind, which is using the interrupt address table. It's a compromise between fixed and vectored interrupt. We still use one interrupt pin and the um, table in the memory will hold an SR address. The peripheral does not provide an address, but will use uh, a index uh, into the table. So let's say the table has 256 words. Each word is an address that the uh, microprocessor can use to find ISR. The peripheral will just say, okay, you go to find index zero, find the that address in the table and go to that ISR or go to, you know, um, interrupt 15 and use the address uh, in that um, uh, location of the table. Uh, and then that's the entry point of the ISR. So in this way, you can use fewer bits uh, to specify the interrupt uh, number. And also you can move the ISR location